Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so starting from this Friday until uh, early April, we will have several research associate, research scientist interview talks during our normal seminar time. And, and also um, there will be some talks uh, on Wednesdays. So um, please keep a close eye on the emails you'll receive from uh, search committee members about the time of these talks and also signing up to meet with these candidates and uh, provide feedbacks. And your feedback is uh, very important for um, this hiring process. Um, okay, so today we welcome our very first research associate candidate, Dr. Srisharan Sridharan. Dr. Shrit Heron is currently an institutional postdoc here at UTIG, and he got his bachelor degree from National Institute for Technology in India in 2014. Then uh, he got a master's degree in geological engineering from the University of Arizona in 2016. Then he moved to Penn State University and worked with uh, Chris Maron on frictional mechanics of stable and unstable fault slip and uh, got his PhD in 2000. 21. He then came here to UTIG as an institutional postdoc working with uh, Luke Lavier, Damien Safer, and Laura Wallace on mechanics and hydrology of slow sleep events. So today he will walk us through the work he has done during his PhD and postdoc, and also he will tell us his vision for his future research. So with that, um, please take it over, Sir Sharon. Thank you so much, Yusha, for that um, introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, am I audible? Can you hear me okay? All good? Uh, awesome. Um, yeah, so as, as you said, today I'll be uh, talking about some of the work that I've done to quantify uh, the mechanics of how earthquakes start using um, experimental rock mechanics and some novel uh, seismological techniques in the lab. Um, and just to keep us sort of grounded in the overarching societal relevance of why we care about these things, um, I have a picture here of the um, aftermath of the 2016 magnitude 7.8 Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand, um, where you can see a train track that's supposed to be parallel to the road uh, making its way into the ocean. So before I start talking about science, I want to um, acknowledge that the research that I'm presenting here today was carried out in two locations. Um, first at Penn State, which uh, stands on the original homelands of the Erie, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, Shawnee, Susquehannock, and the Wajazi nations, and at the University of Texas at Austin, um, which sits on indigenous land. Uh, the Tonkawa lived in central Texas, and the Comanche and Apache moved through this area. And I want to say that in offering this land acknowledgement, I'm affirming indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. So before I start talking about science, I also want to introduce myself a, a little bit more detail so you have some context for how I got here. And I decided what better way to do that um, in a talk about earthquakes than using a map of the countries and coastlines that were affected by the 20, 2004 Sumatra earthquake um, and tsunami. So I come from a small uh, coastal city in southwestern India right at the edge of the damage uh, from the tsunami as far as the coastlines are concerned. And this is also where I completed, um, as Yoshua said, a bachelor's in engineering before I moved to Arizona to get my master's um, in geological engineering. So uh, during both my bachelor's and master's, I broadly worked in problems in geomechanics, but thinking about engineering geology, slope stability, uh, underground construction geomechanics, and geotechnics. After that, I um, moved to Penn State for a PhD in the geosciences, uh, where I worked on problems in earthquake rupture. And then now, uh, as many of you might know, I'm talking to you from uh, Austin, Texas at UTIG. So there's this joke in uh, the engineering circles that if a machine moves and it shouldn't, use duct tape to fix it. And if the machine doesn't move and it should, you use WD-40. And so in some ways, I try to followed this approach in my research philosophy uh, by asking the question of whether a geosystem slips, flows, or breaks, and should it be doing that? So if the answers to these questions are incompatible, uh, I'm typically interested in this problem. Broadly in the past, um, or more specifically, I should say during my PhD, I've thought about the mechanics of earthquake nucleation, precursors, forecasting, uh, and all that from an experimental perspective. And now as a postdoc, I've developed an interest in modeling families of slow earthquakes and thinking about scaling laws as they pertain to 
uh, slow slip events and um, dynamic ruptures. And going forward, I want to uh, focus on granular and frictional processes broadly in the context of geohazards like earthquakes, um, landslides, volcanoes, volcanic flank instabilities more specifically, and the mechanics of basal friction in ice sheets. So the science portion of my talk uh, is divided into three parts, and the bulk of which is in this first pass part, focusing on my past. Uh, then I'll spend five or 10 minutes talking about what I've been up to at um, UT and segue into my future goals and vision for a um, research program at UTIG specifically. Okay. So for the first part, um, which focuses on the seismic signature of earthquake nucleation, I had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with a number of folks at Penn State, as Trisha mentioned, um, Chris Marone in geosciences, um, Chas Bolton, who also happens to be an NSF postdoc at UTIG right now, um, and Jacques Riviere and Parisa Shakuhi, who are professors of applied mechanics and ultrasonics at Penn State. And first I want to start um, with something fundamental so we can get everyone on the same page. I'm recognizing that not everyone on this call is thinking about earthquakes. So I want to quickly talk about how we think earthquakes occur. And the prevailing view for this is that earthquakes are an elastic rebound on a fault. So if we start off with this view on the top left, because of tectonic loading over time, the two plates move in opposite directions and strain accumulates along the fault zone because of friction. Now, when the fault is no longer able to store any more strain energy, the plates snap forward and backwards and you get an earthquake. And the picture on the right shows a broken fence on either side of the fault from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake as evidence of this uh, mechanism. Now, then what happens uh, mechanically during an earthquake or a seismic cycle? And for this, I want to uh, use a plot from Alexis Alt and others where the shear stress on the fault is in blue versus time. And the entire seismic cycle can be divided into three broad phases based on the slip velocity, which is in gray. So a pre-slip phase before ground shaking earthquake where the uh, stress on the fault increases because of strain accumulation. The co-seismic phase where you have the maximum slip, heat, fracturing and ground motions. And finally a post-seismic phase um, which can last for months, tens, hundreds, of thousands of years, where the fault zone re-strengthens and re-accumulates strain energy so it can start this whole process all over again. Now, the co-seismic phase is typically associated with shear heating, melt generation, uh, et cetera, for dynamic earthquakes, which you can see in red here. Okay, so let's take this a step further and ask what happens when an earthquake is just about to begin? We call this the nucleation process, and uh, perhaps predictably, it's both very important and very difficult to identify or quantify in the Earth. And so in this cartoon, um, we have some distance dimension on the fault on the x-axis. This can be a long strike, dip, or some other dire direction, and time increasing up on the y-axis. So our prevailing view is that when the strain is accumulating, the fault slips very, very slowly, uh, before an earthquake. And this period uh, could also have foreshocks and smaller earthquakes, et cetera, leading up to the big event. And finally, when these slow creep events and foreshocks start to happen on a patch that is larger than a critical size, which is LC here, then the event grows uncontrollably into a large earthquake, which ruptures a big chunk on the fault uh, in green. Now, because it's so difficult to reliably image or detect or even understand the nucleation process in the crust, our existing earthquake warning systems, for example, don't have any mechanism to take this into consideration. Um, what we do instead is wait for the earthquake to happen. And when the fault slips during an earthquake, it releases seismic waves. The waves that are most damaging to us are the shear waves uh, and surface waves, which only arrive after the P wave, which is the compressional wave. So the sensors detect the P wave first and send out warnings, which give us a few seconds of heads up. Uh, so incorporating information from the nucleation process rather than waiting for the earthquake to happen can significantly improve our forecasting and early warning frameworks and paradigms. Now, I, I want to admit that I'm not the first one to think about this problem. 
and it's intrigued geophysicists since we've basically known about earthquakes. And in the past decade or so, um, thanks to advances in technology, denser instrumentation networks and all that, we've actually detected some really interesting precursory deformations in a few cases. Uh, so for example, for almost eight months leading up to the uh, 2014 magnitude 8.1 Iquique earthquake in Chile, there was a very long, slow creep on the subduction plate interface, along with some intense foreshock activity, which are all the orange and uh, green patches. And finally, the magnitude 8.1 earthquake, which ruptured the interface. And you can see how uh, remarkably similar to the theoretical earthquake nucleation process this is. Another case of a extremely well-documented pre-seismic activity um, occurred before the infamous uh, 2011 magnitude 9.1 Tohoku earthquake in Japan. So in this map of Japan on the left, the star here is the earthquake hypocenter and all the black curves and are the slip contours of the Tohoku main shock. Uh, the plot on the right shows the Gutenberg-Richter B value over time leading up to the Tohoku main shock, um, which is the a, a red dot. So a B value is basically a logarithmic quantity of earthquake productivity and measures the counts of small um, earthquakes relative to the big ones. So for example, a B value of one means that you have 10 times as many magnitude five events as you have magnitude six events. And so what we see here is that there's a decade long reduction in B value, meaning that leading up to the Tohoku main shock, there were fewer earthquakes in the region, and on average, that they were larger than in the past. So let's quickly summarize what um, I've said so far. I've told you that precursory signals may contain some information about the systematics of a future event. And so then the natural question is, if they're so great, why don't we use them all the time, right? And so there's a few problems with that. First is that the pre-seismic signals are incredibly rare. And we don't know if that's because we don't look for them properly or because they simply don't exist. And second, we only think to identify or look for them after an event rather than continuously. And third, even if we did spot them, we don't know the physics behind these signals. So it's kind of hard to understand what we're seeing. And I'm here to tell you during this talk that the outlook doesn't have to be entirely negative. And this is where lab studies, I think, are incredibly useful because we can uh, reliably see the nucleation process here. So for example, the figure on the right shows you a plot of shear stress and fall slip over time for one seismic cycle in the lab. And the red curve is a continuous measurement of active source P wave velocities throughout the fault. Um, and you can see this dip in VP before the stress drop, which uh, we take to be indicative of imminent failure. So the question I'm setting out to ask today is, um, what are the physical origins of earthquake precursors in the lab and in nature? And before we jump into what I've done in the lab, I want to build some intuition about how we think about earthquakes in the lab. For that, we simplify the very complex dynamic lithosphere into this cartoon model of a conveyor belt with the spring block system sitting on top of it. So when the conveyor moves, it drags the block along with, um, along with it because of friction between the block and the belt. And so the spring stretches. When the spring stretches to its limit, the block snaps back and each of these snap backs represents a crustal earthquake. And we call this a stick slip instability. The stress time curve is this bottom figure from the point of view of the spring. And so the stress increase represents the spring stretching and strain accumulating and the stress drop is a lab earthquake. So just as a piece of interesting trivia, um, lots of other research communities are also interested in studying stick slips. So for example, uh, stick slip motion is the reason you get um, squealing from wet car brakes. Um, it's also how grasshoppers, for example, rub their legs to make sounds. And stick slip is a very undesirable outcome during drilling. So drilling engineers are also interested in this. The lab earthquakes that I'm going to discuss specifically were generated in a custom rock deformation rig at Penn State. So this is a dual axis servo controlled hydraulic press with fault normal stress applied on the horizontal axis 
and a constant shear displacement rate imposed on the vertical axis. So the sample itself is composed of three blocks of granite sandwiched between um, uh, together to form two five centimeter long faults. So these are very tiny faults. And we put a thin dusting of fine quartz gouge to simulate the wear experienced by the faults um, and then shear the longer central block to generate our lab quakes. And I also want to point out that mechanically, these experiments are incredibly well instrumented. We have displacement sensors, load cells, and the horizontal and vertical axes to measure the far field and near field mechanical response. And finally, as we shear the fault, we also continuously shoot and receive ultrasonic pulses through the faults at a very, very high frequency. So we send and receive about a thousand pulses every second and sample each pulse at 25 megahertz. So the idea is that we can resolve the P wave amplitude and velocity properly. So even faults and cracks that look flat are rough on some scale microscopically and look something like this. The, the high frequency ultrasonic waves that I use have wavelengths that are longer than the width of these faults. So when these pulses propagate through rough faults with tiny um, load bearing asperities or contact junctions, they can either pass through an asperity such as this one on the right or through a gap like this one on the left. And when pulses pass through an asperity, there are less transmission losses. And so the elastic wave amplitudes and velocities are higher. When they pass through a gap, the amplitudes and velocities are reduced. So as the fault is being sheared, observing these pulse properties and how they evolve can inform us about the real-time evolution of frictional contact area. And hopefully this can tell us something about the earthquake nucleation process in the lab. Okay, so I run all my experiments and now we'll take a look at what each experiment looks like and what can we learn from it. This is a plot of fault strength on the y-axis against displacement on the x-axis. And this number is just a, uh, an experiment identifier. Um, the black band here is what's interesting and it has multiple stick slip or lab earthquake cycles. So again, just to reiterate, this is the, a fantastic advantage of these types of experiments is that we can study the systematics of literally hundreds of lab earthquakes, which have a full dense array of high resolution of lab scale geodetic and seismic instrumentation. And before I start analyzing my results, I want to show you what these samples actually look like so that you have a sense for um, size and scale. The white patches on the granite blocks um, are the uh, wet quartz gouge and the steel blocks in the back contain the ultrasonic sensors which are stuck to these granite blocks using molasses and you might even be able to see some features in the middle block maybe if you can look closely uh, that look like or resemble slick and lines in the field okay back to the mechanics of the experiment in the next few slides i'm going to zoom into one portion of this experiment and we're going to dissect a few of these lab earthquakes First, uh, we'll look at the shear stress evolution over time for three events. Um, the stress increase, as a reminder, is the intraseismic strain accumulation, and the stress drop is the actual rupture or lab earthquake. And so in our experiments, you can actually hear the stress drop and it'll sound like a clap. Um, next, here I'm plotting the evolution of P-wave amplitudes for these lab earthquakes in purple, and immediately, um, what you can see is a long-term reduction in amplitude before the rupture, which is uh, what my amplitude anomaly arrow is pointing at. And finally, I'm plotting the PV velocities in brown, and suddenly we see something very interesting. The velocities are also reducing anomalously before an event, but not at the same time as our amplitudes. So what's really going on here? Because physically, if the amplitudes and velocities are interlinked, like I told you earlier, this observation does not really make any sense. So I want to show you our experimental configuration again, um, 
and point out that the P waves we're recording sample both the fault itself and the surrounding wall rock. So I'm asking, could this then be a reason for the mismatch in the amplitude and velocity signatures? So to find out, I partitioned the role of the bulk wall rock and the fault deformation on my observations by running a novel experiment called dynamic acoustoelastic testing. So I borrowed this from the nonlinear geophysics community, and it was made popular by some colleagues at Los Alamos um, and my collaborators, Jacques Riviere and Parisa. In this experiment, <clears throat> we take a block of granite of the same length and cross-sectional area as the friction experiment setup and subject it to the same horizontal and vertical loads as the friction experiments. To simulate the stress changes due to the stick slips, we oscillated the vertical load over a range of frequencies and amplitudes and record the ultrasonic pulses perpendicular to the stress oscillation direction. So what does this look like? The, the three plots here show the vertical stress oscillations at different frequencies. So 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and one hertz, um, which is in black. And the corresponding P wave velocities are in blue and the amplitudes are in red with the yellow air envelopes. The lowest frequency corresponds to the interseismic period or the reoccurrence interval of our stick slips in the friction experiment. And the highest frequency um, is close to the lab earthquake rupture duration. And what we can see visually, even to a first order, is that the P wave velocities are more sensitive than the amplitudes to stress variations in the wall rock. Using this data, we can calculate the stress versus velocity and stress versus amplitude relationships like this, and then calibrate our friction experiments by removing the effect of stressing experienced by the wall rock. So in other words, simply put, the friction or stick slip experiments record the full field response of the two faults and the three blocks. And we can simply subtract out the response of the blocks using this nonlinear elastic testing method. So what we're left with is the average fault response, which is what we want to know. Now, before I show you the results of this exercise, I want to recap how to visualize a lab earthquake or generally a seismic cycle by um, looking at the stress time plot from one section of one of my experiments. We can bifurcate the stress into an interseismic, a pre-seismic, and a co-seismic phase. Uh, the interseismic to pre-seismic transition here is based, in my case, on where the shear stress increase becomes nonlinear and deviates from the loading stiffness or compliance of the hydraulic press. Okay, now finally, we can see the results of the two sets of complementary experiments. The top plot shows the P-wave amplitude, and I'm normalizing it and calling it a transmissivity versus time, and the bottom plot has P wave velocity versus time. Remember now, the deep blue lines are the fault zone response, and the black lines are the raw data from our friction experiments. Um, first, we see that the onset of amplitude reduction barely changes, regardless of if you're looking at the bulk or the fault response. And what this indicates is that the amplitude changes we document are entirely coming from the fault alone. But this is not the case for the velocity. Now remember, again, that the bulk velocity has a short-term anomaly close to failure right here. But the interesting thing is that when we partition out the role of the stress increase in the wall rock, the velocities looked very similar now to the amplitude response. Um, and this has a long-term reduction. So what this implies is that P wave velocities contain information about the state of stress on the fault, and probably as the stress increases, cracks in the wall rock are elastically closing and the bulk system is stiffening. This still leaves us with an outstanding question about the origin of the P wave signatures in the fault zone itself. Okay, so this plot has a few things on it. So we're going to take a a uh, couple of minutes here, and we'll start with panel, the stop panel here. Um, I have the familiar stick slip, shear stress in black again, and the P wave amplitude is in purple. Now the green curve is the slip rate of the fault itself on a log scale 
that we estimate through high resolution slip sensors straddling the experimental fault. Um, and what you can see is that the seismic amplitudes basically mirror the fault slip rate. So as the fault starts to have accelerated creep before the eventual lab earthquake, the amplitude is continuously reducing. Thinking back to our original model here for the real contact area, this means that as the fault slips faster than an earthquake nucleates, the real contact area is shrinking and drives the P-wave amplitude and velocity reduction in the fault itself. So what does all this mean for crustal faults, which are you know, significantly much, much more complex? <clears throat> so to answer that, we're going to take a quick trip to Italy on this map, where I want to talk about the 2016 um, earthquake sequence. So this was a pretty complex multi-fault rupture that began with the um, magnitude 6.1 Amatrice earthquake to the south, then the 5.7 Viso earthquake in the north, uh, where you have the beach balls here, and finally the 6.5 North uh, Shia earthquake in the middle. Now on the right, the plot shows time since the Amatrice earthquake um, on the x-axis, and I've marked this dashed vertical line to indicate the final earthquake in the sequence, the North Shia earthquake on day 67. Um, on the y-axis, you have percent changes in the PV velocity at two seismometers, which are colored red um, and blue on the map here. So the PV velocities are from a time-lapse uh, crustal tomography study that was done using teleseismic earthquakes, are earthquakes that happened very far away during these 70 days and sampled the lithosphere in the area. Um, what this group, Claudio Chiraba and others saw is that the red seismometer, which is close to the um, North Shia earthquake hypocenter, there was a P wave reduction or velocity reduction um, for about 20 or so days leading up to the event, which they interpret as the nucleation process but they don't see this precursory signature on the seismometer further to the north. Now, comparing this with what I've showed you in my lab study on a tiny five centimeter fault on the left, where I have the same X and Y axis for my lab quake, the red curve is the fault zone VP, um, which tracks the pre-slip and the nucleation process. So you can see a very clear precursory reduction the blue curve is the raw signal from my friction experiments, which tracks the stressing of the wall rock as well as slip on the fault. And you can't see the precursory nucleation signature uh, particularly clearly. So what these two observations are telling us is that lots of earthquakes in nature could potentially have these types of preparatory or precursory phases, but their signal may not be strong enough because it's drowned out by other signals like from tectonic loading in the far field. And so I'm making a case for denser instrumentation in high risk areas, but also that we need to come up with clever ways to quantify and correct for these external uh, tectonic signatures like we do in the lab. Okay, so the summary of the take home message from what I've said so far is that changes in seismic or elastic wave properties um, can contain lots of rich information about the state of stress in the crust and the earthquake nucleation process. And going forward, I want to leverage this for quantifying earthquake risk and forecasting. Okay, now I want to spend the rest of my time, maybe the 15 or so minutes left, um, talking about some of my current work on slow slip and subduction zones and how it meshes with my plans for uh, future research initiatives. Okay, so I'm interested in the study of slow slip events, um, specifically in subduction zones, um, which are basically an entire family of earthquakes, which are far slower than your conventional dynamic uh, ruptures that last for a few seconds. So slow slip events can last for many weeks or even months rather than uh, just a few seconds. And one of the questions I'm interested in asking uh, is simply, why are slow slips events slow? And without getting into too many details, 
Certain frictional properties determine whether a fault can nucleate an unstable earthquake or if it will prefer to creep quietly. The first requirement for earthquakes is that the fault strength should decrease as it slips faster. And we call this velocity weakening friction. So in this plot on the left, uh, top left, when I increase the sliding speed of the fault in an experiment, the friction will first increase, then decrease to a new value. So what my first requirement here says is that the new strength has to be lower than a previous value. And we measured this in the lab, um, not quite creatively, as A minus B. Now, this change in strength will take place over a distance called D sub C, or what we call the critical slip distance. And this term is directly proportional to this LC, uh, critical nucleation length scale, in earthquake nucleation models. The second requirement is that the fault should be able to heal. Healing is the idea that the fault is able to regain its strength that it lost during an earthquake um, interseismically so that it can rupture again. So without healing, a fault can only rupture one earthquake and then it's done. I'm going to show you examples of both of these requirements in the next few slides. Okay. To answer the question of why slow slip is slow, I focused on uh, shallow events in the northern Hikurangi margin offshore Gisborne, New Zealand, um, where uh, I know a lot of folks at UTIG are already working on this, um, where I sailed on an IODP expedition and collected some deep rocks and lithified sediments um, and conducted friction experiments on the sediment material that may be hosting these events. Um, the manuscript that discusses this work actually just got published a few days ago, so I do um, urge you to check it out if you're interested. Without getting into a lot of details, the degree of velocity weakening, or A minus B, was thought to be somewhat constant uh, for a long time um, based on lab studies. What we found was that this A minus B term, or the degree of velocity weakening, in fact, depends on how fast the fault slides, as does this D sub C, or the critical slip distance. So these sediments from Hikrangi, our idea is that they start off as velocity weakening, but as an earthquake starts to nucleate and the fault accelerates, the fault starts to grow stronger and stronger and buffers out um, an all out fast earthquake. And what's more fascinating is that when we incorporate these, so remember, we measure these on tiny centimeter scale faults. When we incorporate these into numerical models on the bottom right, um, which is something I've been working on with Luke, the velocity dependence of the friction terms significantly slows down earthquake propagation speeds. So here um, in this panel, if the parameters were constant, like we previously thought, you have earthquake rupture velocities of you know, kilometers per second, which is typical for dynamic earthquakes that last a few seconds. Now, when I incorporate the velocity dependence of A minus B into my earthquake rupture, it slows it down significantly and makes the earthquake now propagate for days. So it's now propagating at kilometers per day speeds. So essentially, we've converted a regular dynamic earthquake into a slow slip event using this framework. I'm also curious about how faults regain their strength after an earthquake, which is the second goes back to the healing criterion and whether the same fault can host slow and fast slip. And I've explored this again in the context of the Hikurangi margin. Um, this healing behavior in the lab can be quantified by what are called slide hold slide experiments, uh, which is the two panels you see on the left. Um, where the static friction of the fault changes with time, and you measure this. So we would shear a fault at a constant rate, then suddenly stop to mimic interseismic loading for different amounts of time, which is the x-axis on this bottom panel, and then we re-shear the fault. So normally, the frictional strength after re-shearing will increase as log time, and the slope determines the healing rate um, or the ability of the fault to store elastic strain energy. So I use the experimental data to constrain the expected healing rates in nature 
based on the slow slip uh, stress drops at the northern Hikrangi margin. And we see that the phyllosilicate rich material that is likely hosting these shallow slow slip events um, is unable to store strain energy. And as a consequence, uh, perhaps cannot host or nucleate fast dynamic events, which require a significantly higher healing rate. Okay, finally, this is a snapshot of some of my very recent research uh, from the last couple of months or so, where I argue that we can think about the entire family of slow earthquake modes. So for example, slow slip, tremors, low frequency and very, very low frequency events um, as fundamentally representing the same process at different scales. So this is a log log plot of the fault patch size or asperity size, which is W on the Y axis and the critical nucleation size LC on the X axis. Each circle represents one numerical simulation with a unique asperity size and LC. So reducing LC geologically, uh, what this represents is increased loading, sediment compaction, and potentially strain localization. And what I see is that going from the largest fault size of a few kilometers in the top right and working my way down in size, we can reproduce a range of earthquake behaviors that are observed in subduction zones, depending on what path we take. So what I mean by this is, for example, the red path where LC reduces faster than the asperity size gives you slow slip and micro seismicity. The purple path where LC and W reduce at a constant rate reproduced a family of slow earthquake modes. And the black path where the fault size reduces faster than LC can give you um, slow aseismic transients. So taking the example of a subduction zone like Southern Japan, um, which has the case of CMART subduction, uh, Tian Sun, Susan Ellis, and Damien uh, showed that you typically have micro seismicity in regions of enhanced loading um, down dip of a seamount, transitioning to a seismic slip up dip in a region uh, which could have stress shadows. And this is remarkably consistent with our framework. Uh, for example, the region, uh, the subduction zone here in the shallow region, could potentially be crossing regime C through A as we go down dip along the plate interface. So this is something that I'm working on and I'm happy to take questions. Um, and going forward, if I'm offered this position at UT, uh, my plan is to lead a mechanics of geohazards group, which tackles uh, research broadly in geohazards in the context of time, uh, temperature, stresses, uh, and more importantly, scale, because I think our measurements and models have to be applicable to um, crustal conditions that are uh, many tens of kilometers long. And my expectation is that the broad research direction in my group would be on um, brittle deformation, uh, granular flows, viscous flow with the experimental site incorporating ultrasonic and micro seismic monitoring. Um, I also want to have a numerical modeling component focusing on variable time scales of uh, seconds to hundreds of or even thousands of years. And finally, a smaller portion um, that would focus on statistical modeling as well as data science because uh, lab and field observations uh, and numerical models uh, tend to generate rich amounts of data. So just presenting what I said somewhat differently, uh, simply to emphasize that between these three tools, we can really probe the range of space and time scales that are associated with earthquakes and crustal deformation. Um, for example, uh, the experimental work is really essential for reproducibly testing hypotheses in a controlled setting. Um, and the modeling and data analytics allow us to take this further and integrate experiments with observations in the field. So in my remaining um, maybe few minutes, I want to quickly give a preview of the kinds of research topics and questions I want to work on in my first few years, and then some intermediate and long-term um, vision. And I'm happy to uh, talk about the, the preliminary data sets and motivations for uh, some of these. So first, fluids and heat are basically everywhere in the lithosphere, especially at plate interfaces and subduction zones. 
um, and their interplay, as uh, we all know, affects the nature of deformation behaviors that we see. And similarly, a related topic, fault zone architecture, and specifically how damage zones and fault maturity can affect uh, slip behavior and earthquake production is something that I'm interested in and I'll be focusing on. And because these are somewhat ubiquitous uh, topics that at least recently have community-wide interest, there's a lot of programs that I think I can tap into for funding, say from the NSF and USGS, um, and also SZ4D, uh, which is a new initiative that is poised to succeed um, NSF geoprisms. Another aspect of uh, granular flow that I'm interested in thinking about intermediate to long-term through numerical modeling and experiments is broadly the dynamics of gravitational flows. Um, that could be flank collapse, landslides, and the associated um, secondary geohazards that these processes could initiate like tsunamis or earthquakes. So this is also one area where I see a lot of natural interface with people working on NSAR or remote sensing. And so uh, NASA would be an additional agency that I would be thinking about for um, funding. Finally, uh, another application of my uh, tools that I'm thinking about is the mechanics of bimaterial um, interactions or slip, particularly in the context of basal sliding um, at the ice till interface, uh, which could also apply to regular crustal earthquakes as well. Um, also because uh, geothermal and carbon sequestration initiatives involve a lot of um, earthquake and geohazard unknowns, um, there's a need for rock deformation and microseismic monitoring in uh, projects like the DOE Forge project, for instance, and other kilometer scale facilities that exist both nationally and internationally. So uh, these are some of the um, topics that I'm thinking about uh, applying some of my research tools and skills to. Okay, so at this stage, I've said and shared a lot of things and understandably, everyone's probably a little tired at this point. And so I just want to conclude my talk by saying that if there's one thing and one thing alone you want to take home from this talk, um, it's that seismic waves are really sensitive to the stress state in the earth and movements on faults. And using this information to image the earthquake nucleation process can go a long way in improving how we think about earthquakes. Thank you. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you for the talk, Mr. Sharon. Thank you. So now we have time for questions. Um, you can raise your hand or type in the chat. Um, box and um, and we will go one by one. Oh, Sean has a question. Yeah, uh, thanks. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I was curious about the sediments uh, samples that you were able to measure this velocity strengthening component um, mm -hmm. from offshore. And then you were able to con connect that into a modeling where you got to the point of a, of a slip at, say, kilometers a day. We're, yes. we're still not to a true, you know, long-term slow slip. And I'm wondering if that, if that evolution of properties can keep going <laughs> to the, to, you know, into even more velocity strengthening and even slower processes, or if we need some other mechanism to get to the point of kilometers a year or whatever it takes that, you know, for the long. Yeah, yeah. Slip. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good uh, point. And this is just one instance of one model. And really, you know, we can get as slow as you want or as fast as you want, simply based on the slope of these terms. So for example, here, I just have one example slope that is a square root relationship. But you can see the scatter in the data indicates that that exponent does not have to be a square root. It can be really anything. Same with this, right? There is a uh, well, you have a velocity at which it seems to transition, but presumably that both the velocity as well as the eventual slope are changing depending on the lithology. And that's kind of what we're seeing as well. So for example, experiments on just quartz have a constant A minus B. It's only when you add other additives, um, adulterants like uh, phyllosilicates, for example, that the, the slope tends to change. And so I think just changing those slopes and playing around with those parameters uh, 
um, gets you to really whatever velocities, rupture velocities you want. You can make them really slow, really fast, and also change the slip rate, for example. And uh, changing the slip rate, the maximum slip rate in a given location on a fault, that is something that um, um, KJ, one of my colleagues from Caltech, uh, worked on with Jean-Philippe and Damien. And this is work that was published a couple of years ago in Nature Geoscience. Great, thanks. Yeah. Danielle, you want to ask your question? Sure, yeah, that was, that was an excellent talk. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, your ideas of how you can integrate this type of research um, beyond the, the earthquake sphere, which is obviously very close to my heart, but um, you mentioned you know, applying these types of analyses of you know, frictional behavior to things like ice sheets and basal processes. And I was just wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit, because um, I think it'd be of interest to a lot of people in the discussion. Yeah, um, so right now I've just worked on um, earthquakes in, in, the, in the recent past, right? But there's also a lot of, uh, I think, curiosity in thinking about, for example, uh, how, how do landslides behave? Um, these are granular flow processes that involve significant um, uh, uh, friction but also these are processes that are uh, at the interface of extremely low effective stress. So we're thinking about gravitational flows that are uh, happening in systems that are key kilopascals of stress. So for example, you have a, a region where a landslide is happening and this movement of a significant mass of rock or sediment is changing the effect of stress in that region, right? There is one question, which is how does the landslide itself evolve? But then there's the other question of what happens when that mass of rock or sediment has been displaced. Your effective stress, effective vertical stress in that region is changing. Does that increase the possibility of maybe an earthquake generation in that region uh, transiently? So questions like this, I think, are, um, are, are really important to um, think about um, as interactions between these types of geohazards. And for ice, I was specifically, I'm interested in uh, this, this. So, well, one type of two-phase uh, interactions that I discuss is here, that I'm talking about in subduction zones, you know, what if there is a mixture between brittle and viscous uh, deformation that comes from something that is very strong, like carbonates interacting with something that is very weak, like phyllosilicates. In ice, you have a very similar, but also somewhat different interaction in that you have one block of ice sliding over till. And so that is a different style of bimaterial frictional problem uh, that has not really been explored uh, in a great detail, I think in the rock deformation community. There's definitely a few groups that have made a lot of headway, for example, uh, Christine McCarthy or Lamont, for instance, who has thought about these types of problems. But I think there's, this is ripe for exploration, uh, particularly in the context, say, of slow slip in, uh, uh, in Antarctica, for instance. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So does anyone have questions for uh, Sri Sharon? Please raise your hands. Okay, Krista. Yeah, hi, thanks. That was a, a great talk. I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit more about the numerical modeling work that um, you would like to do. Yeah. So modeling wise, there's, there's a few things that um, I'm involved in. So I want to see them to completion, but also there's a lot of other uh, scope for numerical modeling. For example, um, let's go here again. So a, a lot of my modeling broadly is going to continue to focus, I think on frictional systems as applied to, as applied to geohazards. So, one, one um, aspect of numerical modeling, for instance, could be something like these uh, models of earthquakes are on planar cracks, okay? And that is 
typically the idealized fictional framework that we deal with as far as earthquakes are concerned. But we know that subduction zones are significantly more complex. What you really have is a third volumetric dimension that we need to care about as well, where strain is uh, sometimes distributed, sometimes not. So thinking about numerical models that can incorporate this kind of a, of a third dimension in the shear zone um, is something that I'm interested in and currently also actively working um, with people here on. Another aspect of uh, modeling, again, goes to uh, slightly towards biomaterial friction in that these models have no way of uh, directly thinking about how earthquake rupture would propagate in the two different contrasting compliance materials. This model at this stage does not care about those kinds of questions. So thinking about addressing uh, the, the earthquake problem or the rupture propagation or ground motion problem from a biomaterial framework would be something that would be interesting to me. Thank you. Um, Mark Coos. Hi there. Uh, very Hello. interesting talk there. Uh, I look forward to meeting you. Lots of fertile ground for thinking about things here. But here, if I was hearing it right, and correct me if I got this wrong, in your experiments in through here that had the equivalent of a seismogenic slip event, there were precursors. Yes. And those precursors, what would that translate to for someone to actually study out in the field? Maybe you said it and I didn't quite pick this up uh, with the techniques such as Trugman's and others that uh, are potentially detectable. Right. Um, so directly addressing that question, one thing is simply work that Daniel has done in the past, for instance, is thinking about uh, your magnitude of completeness and looking for foreshocks where people have previously thought there weren't any. So for example, the lower you go in resolution, you might find that there are foreshocks of magnitude one, magnitude zero, et cetera. So really going down to a small resolution to look for foreshocks in very local zones um, um, in the volume, rather than thinking about the crustal volume as a whole, I don't know, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer patch. But more specifically, I want to be clear that for a lot of these earthquakes, what I'm saying from here essentially is that we are looking for slip off the order of a few millimeters to a few centimeters on a meter size patch at a depth of 10 kilometers, for example. So you're looking for very, very, very tiny changes um, that may be precursory. And of course, the, the changes I could expect may scale with the earthquake size for uh, for a large earthquake, like the, the Ikike main shock case, there was a very long-term precursor um, because the earthquake eventually was also big. Um, so the, the types of techniques I think would be simply trying to do these types of 40 uh, time-lapse crystal tomography studies in local volumes where we think there may be high risk, uh, strain meters, um, active source cross borehole experiments, which that style of an experiment has been done at SafeArt in the past successfully where they did see a precursor um, uh, before an earthquake or two. And that work has been published uh, about a decade ago at this point. So these are the types of high resolution space-time studies that would, I think, really help us tease out these types of uh, signatures. Hmm. Uh, I think it might be interesting to take a look at the actual Parkfield earthquake prediction and all the yeah, modeling yeah. that was done and the yeah. event happened. We yeah. had multiple false alarms that did right. not have earthquakes and exactly. then the event happened. And as I understand it, no precursors. Exactly. So that goes back to my question of, you know, th these precursors where you've seen them have been incredibly rare. And we still don't have a good handle on, like the Park Parkfield case, is it that there are some cases where they never happen? Or is it that we're missing out on them? And even in the lab, really, there is a, a recent study uh, by Marcos Curreri and others, where they find that in some mixtures, of, um, I want to say this was in a mixture of anhydrite and dolomite in the lab scale, they don't see any precursors before the stick slips. So it seems like there may also be a lithological effect to whether you can see these precursors or not. What I can say is that for the lithologies or the 
the mineral mineralogies that we have seen in this study, we see the precursors. That is not to say that um, that will be the case everywhere, for sure. Uh, just one last comment. I mean, the, the best monitored work place, as far as I'm concerned, is Japan. They're near mm -hmm. 2,000 uh, seismometers, as well as uh, GPS stations at each one. They've got some very interesting uh, observations concerning multiple earthquakes inside the grid and yep. the scarcity, which I would describe as lack of precursors. Right. So, very good. Thanks. Very, in Thank very you. interesting. Great. So we still have time for one or two quick questions. Okay, um, if not, then um, let's thank uh, Dr. Sushir and Shri Tanran again. And, um, and good luck with the rest of your interview. Thank you. Appreciate it.